Good morning, Central. Come on, stand up with us to sing along. It's a great day to worship. Come on in. Here we go. Sing it out. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of are the days of your servant Moses righteousness be true and though these are days of great trials of famine and darkness and sorrow, still we are the voice in the desert crying prepare ye the way but the singing out it she goes he comes riding on the clouds shining like the sun if the trumpet call, lay up your voice to hear a jubilee out of Zion till salvation comes. Sing these other days. These are the days of the season. The dry bones become his flesh. And these are the days of your servant. And rebuilding that temple of praise And these are the days of the harvest When the fields are as white in the world And we are the laborers in your In your declaring the word of the Lord yeah. Behold he comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun Every trumpet Up to believe out of time till salvation. Do it again. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. Every trumpet call, lift your voice. Hear up to believe out of time till salvation. Here's your part. We're going to bring it down just a little bit. There's no God like you. Come on, sing. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Yeah. There's no God like Jehovah. Come on. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Fill the room. There's no God. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 There's no God like Sing it again, raise it up now. There's no God. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. The hope he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. Every trumpet call, lift your voice. Hear up to believe, out of time. Welcome the Lord in this place. Yes, Jesus, we come to worship you and we pour everything out. Have your way in us, God. Sing with us. Come on. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no Into the darkness you shine And out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you, Jesus None like you Our God is 
is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. together this morning. We're here to praise the Lord. We thank you, God. We started this morning planning the set, just wanted to talk about the Lord's greatness and just declare his name. He is a God greater than all. He is the only God of the universe, the one who is worthy, the only one who deserves to have people come into a room or walk around society and praise his name. Not one of us are worthy to have their name praised. Only the God of the universe. Won't you bow your heads with me for a moment? God, we welcome you in this place and we worship you for all of your goodness and all of your worth. It goes on past what we can see. Your scripture says there's even secrets that only you know. And so God, you are a mysterious Lord that knows everything. To the ends of the universe, God, if there is an end, we just, we yell out, we praise you. You deserve our highest volume and our voice most sincere heart. You deserve movement. You deserve our emotions because you created us to praise you, to breathe in your grace and breathe out your praise. It's all for you today, God, and we worship you. Thank you so much. Heal hearts today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to welcome everyone this morning. I want to welcome all of our first and second time guests. We're glad you're here, and thanks for checking out Central today. 
do me a favor. If this is your first or second time here, in the back of your bulletin, if you don't have one, someone around you has one. In the back of your bulletin, there is a guest information sheet. Take a few minutes for us. Fill it out. At the end of the service, we want you to go back to our welcome booth and our foyer right behind you back there. And we're going to have a little gift for you. And we just want to get to know you a little bit, invest in you. And thank you so much for coming and checking out Central. So, guys, we're going to tune up for a second, go around, shake some hands, find the new visitors this morning. Welcome this morning. Hey, guys, this is Peyton Neal, worship pastor at Central Baptist Church in Tyler. Check us out Sunday mornings at 945 for our small group Bible studies, as well as our 1045 worship service. If you need more information, feel free to visit us at www.centraltyler.org or if you need more information, just check out the number below. Thank you for watching the video of our service today. We would love to see you here soon. All right, all right. You can head back to your seats this morning. As we continue singing, continue to worship, we're going to ask the ask pastor to come forward. Lead us in a little bit different direction this morning. I kind of like seeing that. There you go. Excellent. You kind of make your way back to your seats. So glad to see you spending time meeting and greeting. Isn't it great to have a church family you can be a part of and, and meet and, and get to? We just never have enough time together. We'll help fix that tonight, though. We'll tell you more about that in the uh, time to come. Let me just welcome you again as pastor of the church. If you're here at your first time, you are our special guest. We love having you here. We just want you to feel at home, relax. You're dressed perfectly. You're among friends. Everything we're doing today is meant to introduce you to our God and His Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All the worship, all the preaching, all the teaching, all the fellowship is because we serve a living God and He's giving meaning and power to our life. And you are welcome here in our midst. We're so glad you're part. Thank you for coming today. We do want to give you an opportunity now, if you're our guest today and you're just here for the first, you're not expected to do this, but for our members, uh, we are going to worship in giving, and so that's a way of uh, serving the Lord. It's a giving opportunity. I've, I've been asking for a couple of weeks. We're coming up on our annual Faith Promise Missions Conference in which we will have four missionary families from around the world challenging us about foreign missions, and we're trying to raise some special money to do really nice things for them. I know many of you have already given in Sunday school or you've given online or you've given, and given your tithe, but I'm going to take up an offering for these missionaries in the plate. So anything that goes, I want all your change. I want your loose change. I want your dollar bills. I want anything you don't have, you know, that, that you know, if you've been saving that dollar to give to your son when he's older, put it in the plate. It'll be good. Whatever you have. You can put your car keys in the plate if you want to. I don't care. No, I'm joking about that. But we are going to take a little cash offering to build that up. So on top of that, anything that's loose in the plate will go toward these missionaries. Let's stand. To, oh, not you. Uh, ushers stand. And we're going to receive this offering. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of giving. We would not be able to give except you have already blessed us so richly. Receive these gifts as we mean them from our heart of love to you in faith. In Jesus' name. God bless you as you give today. We appreciate you.
darkness fills the night You cannot hide the light Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy Underneath my feet You are my sword and shield Though troubles linger still whom shall I fear? Sing it out, I know. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind me. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine. The God of Yeah. 
church, come on. We put our hands together this morning. Brothers and sisters, just if there's ever a representation of the gospel, it's preaching those words, just dig into the truth of our God. See, the stone is rolled away. It doesn't have to be Easter. No, you're alive, God. You are living among us. Let's sing that one more time. God, we come to you and we bless your name. We thank you so much, God, and joy for this time of singing and praising with our hearts, our mind, our eyes, our hands being lifted, God. We praise you for it. You are so good and you deserve it all. And just in the circumstance, God, I find myself so grateful to be in the position I'm in, that you would use me as a leader. Use me as a guide, God, and that you would scatter worship leaders all throughout this congregation. There are people out there who are just crying out to you. That your people have come in just to breathe in your grace and breathe out in your praise, God. You deserve it all. We're so grateful. We're so grateful. Thank you, God, that the gospel never gets old. Every time we sing it, we just, every time we hear the story, it just refreshes us. The greatest love story ever told. We thank you, God, so much. Don't let anything hold us back, God. Break the chains in our lives. We praise you for all this, God. For you are worthy of everything. You are a God who saves. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Excellent worship today. I know you enjoyed that as much as I did. What a joy to sing praises to God and, and be a part of that. Turn in your Bibles, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. I hope you brought a Bible with you. Please bring your Bible. You need to keep me honest to make sure I'm telling you the truth, so bring your Bible. If you have it on your iPad, that's fine. If you have it on your phone, that's fine. If you put on Facebook that you're at church and it's a great day, but then be sure and turn your Facebook off and to silence your phone. So if we don't want your pizza order coming due in the middle of the sermon. So we do appreciate you being here. It's always a joy to worship together and be a part of it, and I enjoy all the wonderful tools that God has given us in this new technology. I want to talk to you on the last uh, sermon in the series of chains. We call it Chains, and we're talking about the things that can break us free, how to get free to really serve God as He wants us to do so, and that's what we've been looking at. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we have a, a passage, a short passage, where the Apostle Paul is writing to his young protege, Timothy, and he covers a, a portion that I think will be of interest to us. 
I believe it it starts with verse 4 in your notes, but I want to read verse 3 as well. He says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Particularly verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. The theme for today is, is breaking free to trust yourself. Do you trust yourself? Do you struggle with believing in yourself? I'm not sure a lot of people maybe this, some of you may have a little trouble identifying with this, but it, it's certainly something that I recognized immediately when I was reading what Paul was saying to Timothy when he's reminding him of the faith that he had in his, in his household and then and the, the gift of God that he had and the spirit that he had given him. And I thought, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes to feel confident in yourself. You know, I, I had a little struggle with that earlier in life. I, I know this will come. I'll just confess a little something to you. And make, but uh, when I was young, this may come as a surprise and a shock to you. But when I was in a junior high school, I was not a really handsome man. I know that's really hard for you to understand now. But back then, it was really, uh, I was a late bloomer, you know, like 82 or something. <laughs> it's a late bloomer. But I, I, had a, I, had a, I was blessed with great genetics for height. But they came long before the genetics for weight. And so uh, I was six foot three and weighed about 126 pounds, uh, soaking wet. I had to jump around in the shower to get wet. I was what you might call skinny. Um, so I, did, I tried to play football and sports. I did okay, but I was sandlocked on sports. I had a lot of trouble with sports. I didn't do very good. I was one of those guys who is uh, uniform, never got dirty during the game. Any of you guys identify with that? Your uniform just didn't get dirty. You'd kind of roll around when you were warming up, so at least you'd have a grass stain on you or something. Do it. Uh, it was just not easy. Uh, I, I struggled. I was had a little acne problem, and and that didn't make it easier. So, so it was just a time in which you know some of you remember those teenage years where you just don't quite feel confident. Not everything's coming together for you. And in the middle of all of that, in the middle of this, you know, trying to get a grip. God calls me to preach. I know, I know, it's me too. That was my reaction. I thought, why? I think you meant Ricky Brown. I think you meant to call Ricky Brown to preach, not me. I mean, what are you calling me for? As my pastor used to say about himself, he said, when, when God called him, they flew heaven's mast, a heaven's flag at half mast, and the angels wept. And that's the kind of way I felt about it. I thought, really? You're calling me to preach? I mean, surely there's somebody else that could do this job. And I just don't feel worthy or able or full of confidence to do these things. And so uh, I identify a little bit with Timothy here and this lack of personal uh, trust in self. Maybe you can identify with that. And some of you say, well, why, how does not being able to trust yourself hold you back? Well, if you can't trust yourself, you'll never let yourself try anything new. Some of you, uh, you're limiting yourself constantly because you don't trust yourself. So you you found you a nice little safe bubble of a world, and you got it in a nice little organization, and that's where you stay all the time. But, you know, you've got to trust yourself so you can try new things. If you don't trust yourself, and this is important, no one else will trust you. I, I think one of the greatest lessons I learned when, when I got my... Uh, education was that um, what we think we, what we feel about ourselves, we can't, or what's going on within us is projected without us, without us realizing. In other words, you may think you're hiding feelings of insecurity, but you're not. They really are projected in the way you deal with people. And if you don't, if you don't trust yourself, other people sense that about you. In fact, you know, it's, it's kind of hypocritical to ask people to trust you when you don't trust yourself. And people pick up on that. And here's an interesting thing. If you don't trust yourself, no one will think much of your God. 
I got that from a young man that I've been working with, trying to encourage him going through trials in his life. And I told him I was going to preach this sermon. And I said, I'm struggling to come up with a, what does not trusting yourself mean? And he said, well, if you don't trust yourself, people are not going to trust your God. You see, how can you say your God is great if you don't trust yourself? How can you be the servant of a great God when you don't even trust yourself? Now, it's important to trust ourselves. Psychologists, self-improvement trainers think so. Uh, Trust is defined as the belief that another person or group will do what is expected and it's formed early in life, usually starting with our family. Many psychologists believe that trust begins in infancy when a child learns that he can or he or she can trust their parents to take care of their needs when they cry. That's really young for trust to be learned. But when they cry and you respond, they learn they can trust you. How many of you played the little game with your toddlers where you put them on something and you say, jump, and you catch them, right? And you jump. And they, isn't it some, it's amazing. Most children, when they have such complete trust in their parents. They'll jump. Most, now, the tricky thing about that, and I learned this the hard way, if you're playing that game with your infant or not your toddler and you put them on the counter and you say, jump, and you catch them, don't turn away because they will sometimes jump before you say jump, Right? That's, that's the reason some of mine have knots on their heads. Because they, they will jump when you're not ready for them. But they learn to trust you that if they jump, you're going to catch them. Here's the, here's the trust, I mean, the main point of this section of the sermon. Without trust, fear rules. Without trust, fear rules. Some of you are sitting in front of me today with fear bubbling at the edges of your consciousness. Just underneath the surface, you are afraid because you don't trust. Without trust, fear rules. Here's some signs of how it comes out in our relationships. The complete inability to become intimate with another in romance or friendship relationships. That's a result of trust. You'll never really build intimacy in friendships or romantic relationships if you can't trust people. The inability to maintain a friendship due to issues of mistrust. You're always thinking somebody's being wrong toward you. Racing thoughts and suspicions that friends or family are out to get you. Intense fear during any type of intimacy. Lack of trust interferes with all partnerships, romantic or otherwise. And a series of dramatic and stormy relationships. Some people are serial in their relationships because they have trust issues. And the steadfast belief without burden of proof that other people are malevolent and lying to you. Do any of you just think the world's out to get you? The inability to trust self. The individual is unable to trust him or herself feels as though he or she is a failure and that he or she is not worth a good relationship, which means he or she sabotages it by being abusive, driving the person away, while constantly questioning their partner, needing to know what is going on in a relationship and where it's headed. Those are classic signs of lack of trust. We just don't trust them. And as a result, we end up alone and we end up damaging other people. What's the source of lack of trust? It could be childhood abuse, might be that. It could be past failures. That's often the case. It's pretty hard to keep going when you've suffered a major emotional or financial or spiritual failure. Poor parenting. Perhaps your parents may have done the best they could, but they were hurting themselves. Maybe they were mentally ill. We've all seen children, unfortunately, that their parents were struck with mental illness and it didn't become apparent until later in life and those poor children had their entire life shaped by growing up in such a home. Um, alcoholic parents or drug addicted parents can cause a lack of trust in self. Well, all of that. Okay, so everybody's like, okay, all right. Enough psychology, Pastor Beckham. Why is this important to Christians? Why is it important to Christians? Because that's what we are here today. This is a Christian church. We've come to worship God. And why does lack of trust, what does it have to do with being a Christian? Well, first of all, let me say, we're not supposed to trust ourselves at all, technically, spiritually speaking, but I'm going to come back to that in a moment. For Let me just go to some other issues about it. When we don't have the ability to trust ourselves, we will let fear rule in our lives. 
Now, it wouldn't bother me so much if you were just letting fear rule your financial life or fear rule your emotional lives, but you let fear rule your spiritual lives. And when fear rules your spiritual lives, you are not the servant of God you're supposed to be. You're not as effective for the kingdom as you need to be, and the whole kingdom work suffers. We would, when we have trust issues, we don't form strong churches. You know why? Because community demands trust. You can't have, a church is, among many other things, a community. It's an interlocking of the lives of individuals. We gather around our faith in Jesus Christ and we lock into each other. We become a body, one body, the scripture says. We become one thing. We become this living, breathing entity. It's a church, but it's based on the ability to trust. And if you can't trust people, you're going to have a warring church. You know, ever so often I uh, get called up by churches that have gone through a struggle with their previous pastor or they've had some kind of a uh, a war in the leadership of the church. How many of you have ever been in a church, uh, just nod your head because I don't want to scare the people that are just visiting today, but if you've ever been in a church that, that there was just some uh, war going on amongst the leadership of the church, just kind of nod your head a little bit. You ever seen anything like that? Or Okay, well, it happens. I'm sorry to say. It has not happened here too much, but it has happened. And occasionally I get a phone call since I'm now... Uh, old minister, <laughs> since I've been around a while, they'll call me and they'll say, we've gone through this big, big struggle in our church and we're getting ready to call a new pastor and we want you to help us set up our bylaws or set up our rules in such a way that we don't have this problem in the future. And so they start making out a list of qualifications for their pastor. And then, you know, first of all, they got the biblical qualifications. And then they start listing every single thing they can possibly think of and every kind of scenario they can possibly think that dream up that might come up where there might be a problem. And they end up with a 25-page document. And they say, what's the first thing you think when you see our idea? I said, the first thing I think is I would not be your pastor. You can't, listen, you cannot, you cannot legislate a community. You either trust each other or you don't. I either trust you as church members not to be having meetings after church to attack the pastor. And I know you wouldn't do that, right? So I either trust that you're not doing that and I just relax and be your pastor or you have to trust that I'm not out to get you and that I'm really not taking advantage of you. And you either trust or you don't trust. But you can't form community without trust. And we can't form church without trust. And you know what that means? That means vulnerability. It means we take a risk. It means every single Sunday that I come to church could be my last. Right? It means that some Sunday you could come to church and the leadership could do something really weird or crazy that might hurt you. We don't know. We just have to trust each other. We trust that we're God's people. We're working together, and we're going to believe in each other and keep going together. So it's important because we don't form strong churches. It's important because we spend our lives playing defense in the culture wars. Some of you are not standing for your faith in the community when the culture is saying that things are right, that the Bible says is wrong, because you don't trust yourself to be a witness for Christ. We can't afford for you to play defense. We need you to play offense. We need you to stand for your faith. And fourth, we will not attempt Christian duties because we lack trust. We don't share our faith with friends. We don't rebuke sin among our close relatives or friends when we see it. Even though the scripture says when you see a believer that's living in sin, if you will rebuke him in his sin, you can spare him a lifetime or her a lifetime of sorrow. We don't do it, do we? We've got friends that are doing things that are just destructive and terrible and we just cluck our tongue and say, I'll pray for them, but you don't rebuke them. And the reason you don't rebuke them is because you don't trust yourself. And so on and so forth. So, it is an important issue for Christians. Now, let's look at a biblical example of struggling to trust self and see if we can learn something. Here in our passage in 1 Timothy, we see uh, that Timothy was Paul's protege. He was his right-hand man. 
He had traveled with Paul on his missionary journeys. He had learned from the feet of the master how to be a preacher, how to be a teacher, how to be a pastor, how to lead a church. And he had been left in Ephesus to solidify the ministry that Paul had begun. Paul and Timothy, working together in the great city of Ephesus, had started a church, and they had had good success. They had numerous believers, and the church was prospering. Paul had moved on to his next assignment. He had left Timothy behind to continue the good work. And Timothy is there to continue the three-year ministry that Paul had begun. But Timothy seems to have confidence issues. He, he gets reminded of his gifts. He gets reminded not to be afraid. He, gets re- he seems to be afraid to step up and take the leadership role in which he has been placed. So let's look at two strategies that Paul uses. First of all, turn to 1 Timothy, back a couple of pages, chapter 4. Again, writing to young Timothy, in chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, Paul reminds Timothy of his spiritual gifts. He says in verse 12, we're talking about a young man lacking confidence in himself and trust. He says in verse 12 of chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by the prophecy of And by the laying on of the hands of the eldership, meditate on these things. Give yourselves entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear them. Can you hear the heart of the mentor, the heart of the leader, the heart of the pastor trying to encourage his young protege? And he said, look, don't let anybody despise you. I know you're nervous about the fact that you're young. It's a scary thing to be young in leadership, right? How many of you had a leadership position when you were young in your business or somewhere? It's a scary thing. You know, I started pastoring a church when I was 23 years old. 23 years old. I was pastor of a church. I wouldn't even hire a worship pastor that was 23. Oh, wait, I did. Uh, I wouldn't even. Just joking. Just joking. But I would, I, you know, really 23 now. Does, how many of you are like me? 23 seems really young. Does that seem young? That's a baby, isn't it? That's a baby. But I was pastoring a church at 23, 23 years old. And um, Timothy's young. It's hard to, I remember a guy saying to me one time, we were in a discussion and we were arguing about something. And he said to me, I was a leader in the church before you were born. I couldn't argue with that. Looked like he was a leader in the church when Moses was running the church from what I could tell. That was ugly, wasn't it? I was young. I was 23. But yeah, it's kind of intimidating when you're, when you're you know, you, you are trying to lead people that are older than you and more experienced than you and been down the road further than you. And Timothy's got this, this problem of, of feeling confident, and Paul reminds him of his spiritual gifts. Notice particularly, he says, do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy and the laying on the hands of the eldership. Timothy had something God given. The Holy Spirit had given him this gift. It was a gift that was recognized in the church. In fact, it had come through the instrumentation of the eldership in the church. He had received this spiritual gift. And it was a gift that was powerful. Paul says, recognizing the power of this gift. Listen, you know what 1 Corinthians 12 teaches you? Every believer in Christ has at least one spiritual gift. We have something. The Holy Spirit indwells us and Every one of us has at least one spiritual gift. And if you've received a spiritual gift, you don't need to be intimidated. If you have a spiritual gift from God, you need to be able to trust in that gift. You need to say that this is what God, and that's what I had to do sometimes when I'd say, look, I understand, I don't know everything, I understand, I'm I'm so green as I can be, but I'm telling you, God's hand is on me, God called me, I have this gift, and I am the pastor. You know, and you have gift too. I don't know what your gift is, but you have your gift and your spiritual gift. And if you have a spiritual gift, you should not be intimidated. Listen, I like this translation of that verse when Paul says, 
don't neglect the gift that is within you. He said, another translation, I'm reminding you to shake the ashes off the God-given fire that is in you. Woo, I like that. Shake the ashes off the God-given fire that is in you. And if I could digress a little bit and, and quit preaching and start meddling. Some of you believers in Christ need to shake the ashes off the God-given fire that he put in you. I watched a movie a number of years ago. Uh, my wife and daughters liked this. It was when the girls were still home. And so when the girls were home, we watched a lot of chick flicks, right? The only good thing about chick flicks is popcorn. But nothing blew up, nothing exploded, nobody got shot. It was, you know, no boats were crashed. But I'm watching this because... I want to be a part of the family. I want to be there. I want to be accepted. I'm not sure if I should name the name of this movie, but I'm watching this movie. Anyway, in this movie, it's about a woman who's going through this difficult time in her life. She's suffered a traumatic divorce and a betrayal by her husband, and she's trying to rebuild her life. And she's, at one point, that, the heart of the movie, she's trying to refine herself. She's crying out in desperation to a friend, and she says, I don't know what's happened to me. I don't know where my courage went. I used to be fierce. That stuck with me. I used to be fierce. Did you used to be fierce? Did you used to be something? Did you used to be a force to be reckoned with? Did you used to be someone who filled the room with your presence? Did you used to be someone that when there was a, when there was a discussion, you would speak up? Did, did you used to be a person of passion, spiritual passion, who had a spiritual gift? And with that spiritual gift, you were fierce in your witnessing, fierce in your service, fierce in your giving. It's time to shake the ashes off the God-given fire that's in you and get back to serving God. Amen? I, I just, man, you know... Sometimes I watch people go through trials, and, and when you start through the trial, you know what I think is your pastor? I think, well, well there's a couple of years on the shelf, because I know what's about to happen to you, I, I, or what happens to most people. You're just going to get wounded and whacked around, and you're just going to go into seclusion and pull in and hide and not serve, and, but you know what? It's time to shake off the ashes. Of the God-given fire that's within you. All right, second strategy Paul had was role modeling. He modeled the faith to Timothy. He was an example. I've already mentioned that he spent several years being his hands-on mentor and trainer. Role models increase our ability to trust. The reality is if I can see another person do something difficult, then at least I know it's possible. And if it's possible for them, then very likely it's possible for me. Part of the reason why I'm here today or stayed in the church through the years is because of the great people at Central Park Baptist Church in Farmers Branch, Texas. The people like the Sullivans and the people like the Clarks and the people like the Slaytons and a hundred other names of families that were good, godly Christian families that weren't perfect, but they knew how to serve God. They knew how to be disciplined in their spiritual life. And they modeled for me what Christian life looked like. Because I didn't have that at home. I had good family at home, but I didn't have a Christian family at home. I didn't know what it was like to get up and go to church and, on a regular basis. I didn't know that, you know, if you really were serious about serving God, you went all the time. Some of you still not sure of this concept. But when... When you accept Christ as your Savior, you become the part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you go when they have services. You don't forsake the assembling of themselves together. And, you know, I would go to church service no matter when I went. I knew I was going to see the Colbys. I knew I was going to see the Sullivans. I knew I was going to see the Davises because it was church. And if they were having church, they were going to be there. Would God we had that again. And, and may I say something to you older church members, I don't mean chronologically old, but older in the faith. You have a responsibility to model that to these young believers. I'm teaching some wonderful young people now, and they need to be able to know when they show up at church, you're going to be there. 
told you I was going to meddle a little bit. Role models teach us the ability to get something done. And look at verses 4 through 7 of our text. Notice right in the middle of it, Paul says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in thee also. He learned it first from his family. He had advantage I didn't have. He learned it from his mother and his grandmother. Oh, thank God for godly mothers, fathers, godly grandparents. The role models. You know, I really thought I was getting out of this. How many of you, like me, you, 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 you got married, you had kids, and, and you looked at that little bundle, and you thought, this is wonderful, and then you thought, this is terrifying, right? I'm responsible for this thing, and if I drop it, it'll break. You know, I don't, frightening. I mean, I'm responsible for this child. I've got to feed it, clothe it, see that it's educated, and then I get to church, I've got to see that it comes to know God, see that they follow God. That's a lot of pressure, right? Did y'all not feel that pressure? You weren't taking it serious enough. That's scary stuff. But I thought, if I can just get my kids grown and married, I'm done. Whew, man. Get them grown and married and get them out of the house and, and know that they succeeded. I'm done. I've succeeded. Yay. I can rest now. Amen. And what did they do? They went and had little rugrats of their own. And now I'm responsible to be an example to my grandchildren which are above average grandchildren, of course. But still, I have that, you know, you feel my pain. Some of you grandparents feel my pain. Can I, hear a, can I get an amen from the grandparents? Yeah, we, it's not over, is it? You still got to be a role model, a role model. I saw, you, Timothy, you saw the faith first in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. I want my kids... And I know you want your kids. And I want my grandkids to say, you know, they showed us how to live for God. They showed us how to walk with God. Again, this young man that I was talking to about this, trying to get through the grips, going through a trial. I said, what does is, what is trusting in yourself mean? He says, when you truly believe in God, without a doubt, you develop an enhanced belief in yourself. When you truly believe in the Lord, without a doubt, you develop an enhanced belief in yourself. And he's right. So let me conclude this. What if you began to con- trust yourself? What if you rediscovered what was fierce about you? What if you began to believe in the gift that God put in you again? A couple of ideas. If you trusted yourself, you could do what Christ has demanded of you. Most of you know that the Lord perhaps, or some of you, let me put it this way. Perhaps some of you feel a call from God for a particular ministry and a particular duty. And you know God wants you to do it, but you're not doing it. Because you don't trust yourself. But if you believed in yourself and trusted yourself, you could do what Christ demanded of you. Secondly, you could, if you trusted yourself, you would trust yourself enough to hear the voice of the Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit lives in you, lives in, if you're a believer, you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God, and you can hear his voice too. Years ago, I had a guy come to me one time and, and just getting started, and I'm still trying to find my way, and an older man, and he said, Pastor, I need some help. I said, yeah, what's up? And he said, I'm needing to buy a car, and I need to buy a new automobile, and I need you to tell me which automobile God would have me to buy. I thought it was a joke. I mean, I, I did have some nice cars, but I didn't, you know, I, I was a pastor, not a car salesman. I'm going, why? Are, you know, but he said, no, seriously. He said, you're God's man. You're my pastor. I trust you. You tell me what kind of car I'm going to buy. I said, I'm not doing that. I said, you know, that's not, my, that's not in my calling. But let me, and here's the real problem. The real issue is, he, I said, why would you? He said, well, because you hear God's voice. And I said, but you have the Holy Spirit living in you as well. And my job is not to give you a list of rules to live by. My job is not to give you a a list of minute details of even what kind of car to drive. My job is to teach you this holy book so that you can hear the Holy Spirit that dwells in you speak to you. 
the same spirit that's in me, if you're a believer in Christ, is in you. And you need to trust yourself enough to hear his spirit, to hear his voice too. And if you trusted yourself enough, you would be able to face an uncertain future. Sometimes we run to the past because we're afraid of the future. But you can't go back. The world's always changing. I know some of you are in situations you don't want to be in, but the sooner you accept the reality you are in that situation, and that is your world, the sooner you're going to move forward. You can't go back. And you have to trust that the God who brought you this far is the God who's going to take care of you in the future. You know, I was, I was listening to the news the other day, and boy, it was, I just thought, well, this is it. This is the last year. We're not going to make it to 2015 because, I mean, we got Ebola, we got ISIS, we got, and they were naming all the terrible things, and the whole world's coming to an end. So if any of you have been planning to give all of your money to the church before the world ends, you've got to do it in the next two months. It's all over. Then, I, you know, I'm sitting there listening to this litany of loom, gloom and doom and end of the world, and I thought, oh, I remember 1978 and the oil embargo crisis when gasoline went from 33 cents a gallon to a dollar or two dollars a gallon, and I remember everybody saying, the world is coming to an end. It's all going to be over. We're finished. We're toast. We're history. You remember Y2K? Keith, Keith remembers Y2K. Y'all remember Y2K? Some of you weren't born in Y2K, <laughs> but the year it turned 2000, ancient history for many of you, they didn't think the computers could roll over and the whole world was going to come in. I mean, you think, oh, that's no, oh, they didn't believe that. Oh, yeah, they did too. We had to have a panel of computer experts have a, have a panel discussion in church and say, it's not going to be the end. I know some of you are really looking forward to getting a little older. Good news, you probably will. And then you can start making car payments. <laughs> you can start. Anyway, no else. You, if we trusted ourselves, we could face an unfer- uncertain future without fear. And lastly, if you trusted yourself, you could stand for God in a hostile world. Next week, I'll begin a series on Daniel, the great prophet in the Old Testament, and the sermons will be based on standing for God in a hostile world. I don't think American Christians have been in as hostile environment in our history as we are in right now. But that's okay. That's all right. Our God is great. Our God, the God of angel armies goes before us. You know, we're ready. We can take it. We can handle it. We're not going to be afraid. We're going to deal with what comes. All right. Having said all that, let me bring you back to where I started. When I was a kid, I was telling you I used to struggle with a little bit of self-image. And we used to have, if you'll indulge me a few minutes, an old evangelist come into our church. Uh, he wasn't old at the time. An evangelist come to our church that spoke to me. And he really spoke to me. And I, and I haven't really figured it out until just recently why, why it was so powerful to me. But, it, but this guy, uh, he, was, he was a gifted speaker but he, uh, and he played the piano, and he did something else that nobody else did. It was kind of his, his stick, you know, that made him different. He played the handsaw, and he would, he would take the handsaw. You ever seen anybody play a handsaw? He, it made, it made play hymns on the handsaw every service. And it was really kind of cool to watch. His name was Tommy Stone, and he had a, several little songs that he had written, and he played the piano sort of. He courted, you know. His, I, I, I thought I was playing the piano. My wife before me was just courting, but he, whatever that is. Some of you people know. But he was courting, and he would sing songs, and they were, but he had a good voice, and, and it, blessed, it blessed us, and he'd tell stories. He, he was from Henderson, Texas. He was saved in the oil field, an oil field, oil, oil, <laughs> oil field worker, and, and he got called to preach, rough as he could possibly be. I mean, rough. And he got called to preach, didn't bother to go to Bible college, just picked up a Bible and started preaching. And he had a gifted communication, so he started gathering people around him. But he, he really had trouble with his reading. He, we'd be reading a passage of Scripture, and especially Old Testament, he would come to names and he would go, big word, big word. He'd be like, instead of reading, and Jeff and I, Zed, Zed and I, he'd say, and big word, big word, big word, big word, big word, big word, did this or that. Y'all remember that? He did that. That was the reaction he got too, but... I'm going to start trying it. Maybe it'll help me. 
but we used to have him regularly in our church, and we would have people saved, and, and he would sing. And I, and I never have forgotten. He used to sing a little song called A Child of the King. Maybe Corden, is, it's a song over on the piano. And the song was about a prince who goes, uh, well, I'll, I'll just give you the words. One day a prince was riding the forest near this castle where he lived. In the distance he heard a sound of wood chopper chopping wood. As he rode, he listened to see if he could hear what was sung, and this is what he heard. He's singing this. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the king. The prince said, you're not the child of the king. I'm the child of the king. How come you're singing that? And the woodchopper chopped, and he sang. My father is rich in houses and land. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. But the prince said, you're not the child of the king. I'm telling you, I'm the child of the king. How come you're singing that? You're a nobody. And he sang as he chopped. I once was an outcast, a stranger on earth, a sinner by choice, and an alien by birth. But I've been adopted, my name's written down, mayor to a mansion, a robe and a crown. The prince said to the woodchopper, you're not the child of the king. I'm the child of the king. If you're the child of the king, how come you live in that shack over there? And the woodchopper chopped and he sang this. A tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, still I can sing all glory to God. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus, my Savior, I'm a child of the king. That was over 50 years ago. And I can still hear it. And I just now know why it was so meaningful to me. Because as he sang that song, he was singing his credentials as a saved oil field worker with little Bible education. And he was saying, I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. Praise God Almighty, I'm a child of the king. And, and when he sang it, it became my song as a troubled young boy trying to find my confidence. I may never be the orator that some are. I may never have the intellect that some do. I may never have the organizational skills that others have. And I may never have striking good looks, but I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus, my Savior, I'm a child of the king. (laughs) And for nearly 40 years, I've just been doing what he called me to do because I'm not leaning on me, I'm leaning on him. And it's time for you to lean on him and do what he's called you to do. Because you too are a child of the king. A child of the king. Jesus is my savior. I'm a child of the king. Let's stand to our feet for a moment. Hi, my name's Kim Beckham. I'm the pastor of Central Baptist Church. Thanks for tuning in today and being a part of this worship service. I hope you found the message helpful and the worship inspiring. If you don't have a church home, please come check us out on a Sunday soon. If you should have any question about today's message or just want to talk about spiritual things in general, please check us out on our website and email us or call us at Central Baptist Church, 903-561-6361. So glad you are a part of the worship today. Come see us soon. God bless you.